Thank you very much. Um, and thanks everybody for coming along today. I'm standing on unceded Wurundjeri country in the Dandenong Ranges in Victoria and pay respects to elders past and present. Um, today, I'm going to potentially not tell you anything that you don't already know. Um, I might just, I'm just going to weave some threads together to let you know how I got to where I got to. And I'm really hoping to have a conversation to hear from you, get feedback from you about what I've been thinking and how, where I've arrived and to see, uh, to get your reflections um, on that. So I've got a, a PowerPoint and it is a bunch of threads I'm weaving together just to explain how I got here. Um, but very quickly, yeah, my career is in disaster management, disaster emergency management. And for most of that career, it has been involved in the people and human uh, elements of disaster preparedness, response and recovery. Both, I've worked at all three tiers of government in Australia um, around policy strategy and then on the front line, and I'm a volunteer firefighter with Australian Red Cross and emergency services. So I've been moving between front line and the policy, national policy level, uh, but usually with a human focus. Um, and then as Rachel said, in the last two years, I've had this fabulous opportunity to provide a different lens. And that is to consider particularly wildlife threatened species, ecosystems, habitats, and biodiversity in the context of disasters. And that has been a real shift for me. Um, in the way that we think about our um, disaster resilience and emergency preparedness um, to have as uh, the focal point um, nature and the environment and conservation elements as opposed to people. Um, and so that's been really interesting for me and it's something that I'm really, I'm really keen to explore further. And I guess I'll just say at the outset, uh, it doesn't have to be either or. It's not about either people or nature. It's how do we make sure that we do it together, right? So it's, it's working alongside and, and, and doing both as best as we can. So I'll share my screen and let you um, have a look at some of, these, um, some of these concepts. So this is how I like to start, right? Because it's scene setting. Some people are so poor, all they have is money. Um, and I bang on about this a lot. And the context there is that there is more to life than money. And obviously when we're working in a disaster and an emergency context, we always have to put a dollar value on things to, to get resources or to understand what our priorities should be. So just remember that some people are so poor, all they have is money. And I suggest that richness comes from something that's beyond just about financial and economic resources. So again, working at that interface between the emergency management sector, I'll call it the biodiversity sector for want of a better word, and, and climate change. And so what I found when I went along, along to a lot of forums, meetings, workshops, think tanks, conferences, is that there was a gap in between these three conversations. So there's a bunch of people talking about conservation and biodiversity um, that were focused on, for example, um, saving species from extinction and doing a lot of work without actually a really good view about the impacts of climate change and potentially the impacts of a massive bushfire. Um, and all of the work that has been done for 30 years could be wiped out in a moment if they haven't brought in consideration of changes to ecosystems from climate change or from a natural hazard disaster. Talking to climate scientists, the information that they're providing is focused in a disaster space, and but very much focused on lives, livelihoods, businesses, infrastructure and thing. And every time I'd pipe up, what about nature? They'd go, oh yeah, that's right. There was an appetite, but just not a focus or a priority. And in the emergency management sector, it is very people centric to my mind. And that's certainly been my experience. I'm not saying we don't care about nature. There's been some great examples, but it's still very much about saving lives and properties. And I would just love to see more consideration giving to something bigger than that. So um, sneak peek I showed Rachel before this, this chart I think demonstrates um, in terms of our priorities and what we, if we look at the bigger picture. So you may have seen this before, you know, we thought COVID was big and life-changing in an ex existential moment. And now looming RBA interest rates, cost of living is now coming onto our screens every day. And that feels bigger. And then we know that looming over the top of that is climate change. Now, I don't think we have yet fully appreciated collectively in a broad sector, this, this audience probably, but biodiversity collapse 
is like, you ain't seen nothing yet. And this is not a hopeful image. And I should have started by saying that I am hopeful and I'm curious and I'm trusting in the way that I give this presentation. I encourage you to see the hope in the conversation, not fear. Um, but, but I think we need to have our eye on the really big thing um, because other stuff that felt hard, that might have been nothing. You ain't seen nothing yet. So just having a bigger picture, right? And it's not like I'm the first person to say that, hey, nature's important, let's think about it. You know, and here's a statement here from IUCN, you know, investing in nature is something that we need to do and it has obvious effects now and in the future and it can't be ignored. And it's very much talking around investment and it's talking about making sure that we look after nature to talk about us, right? And even UNDRR talks about this. It's still human centric. We're supporting nature to support us, right? What have we supported nature to support nature? Like it's still putting us in the middle of all of our conversations. Nature-based solutions, it's about finding solutions that nature can provide to help us. So imagine at the moment, and so here are the pillars, the pillars of um, uh, disaster um, recovery. There's four pillars. There's the built, the economic, the natural and the social or human environments. This is the diagram on the left. So at the moment, humans very much in the center. So we think about the human impact of disasters and then we think about the built and the economic and the natural environment. Imagine if we flipped it and put nature in the middle and said in our disaster preparedness and response and recovery, our real focus is on supporting and protecting and building resilience in nature. And then we thought about the human economic and built after that. Now that's a stretch, right? Because we're never gonna have an emergency services agency that puts a tree ahead of a person. But as I said, it's not either or, it's all of these, just imagine. And as soon as we start separating nature and humans, of course our indigenous wisdom says they're not separate, they're the same, it's all the same thing. Nature and humans are one and the same. So our indigenous wisdom says that if we are part of the system and not separate from the system, it's a way to move forward with the conversation. So here's a diagram that you might've seen from the IPCC, right? It's understanding our risk framework. So we have weather and climate events, um, that inform risk and uh, inform natural hazard disasters. And our risk is a combination of our vulnerability and our exposure to those events. So mitigation is around mitigating weather and climate events. Adaptation and resilience is built by addressing our exposure and our vulnerability. So my concern with this diagram is it sort of starts with risk and talks about risk. And I think in disaster management, we talk about risk a lot, but I think that it's better if we put value in the middle. Before we understand what the risk is, surely we need to understand what we value first because we, it's not a risk unless it is to something we value. And I think that if we started the conversation is what do we value, what's important to us, we would have a slightly different way of approaching risk and disaster risk. And the reason why I wanna talk about what we value because we very quickly think about material things, which is important. But I think sometimes there's an opportunity if we said, what do we value? Well, clean air, clean water, open spaces, green spaces, um, a good marine ecology and biology. So I think that we need to expand the conversation using the term value to include nature, environment and conservation elements, not just the stuff, the business, the home, the car, the things, right? So starting to talk about what we value and having an honest conversation about what's important to us. Don't forget, some people are so poor, all they have is money. So this is an example of the state emergency management priorities in Victoria. Now, when I first heard about the priorities and I heard that environment conservation assets and also cultural heritage is included, I heard it was number six on the list. And I was excited because I thought that's not bad, right? Six, that's good, six, that's not too far down. But of course, the good news is that there's only six on the list. So it's last on the list. The bad news, it's last on the list, but the good news is it's on the list. So what I'm saying is we, I'm, we're not gonna get number six up to number one, because if you look at the other five, you can see there that they're pretty important. You know, we need to protect those things. And you know, this is during a response phase. My, my advocacy piece is around, but it's on the list. Let's devote resources, investment and thinking and planning and strategy to protection of the environment and conservation assets as well, not as an afterthought and not as an only if. 
So it's about investing in our priorities, all of them, not ignoring some of them. And I've just seen examples in my work where it is often ignored, even though it's on the list. So if we put nature in the middle, how would we do that? How could we have a conversation that doesn't sound harsh in terms of respecting human life by putting nature in the middle? So it's, it's about, if we considered the impacts and consequences of a disaster event in the context of nature. So to think about that too. So what is this thing that we're going to do for people? What's it gonna do for nature? And then if we think about longer term whole of life and multi-generational impacts of things that we do on nature. So to, to shift this three-term election cycle into an inter, intergenerational consideration, it's gonna be hard because we struggle to think beyond three years now. But if we thought about what we do today about future generations, and really thought about it, not just as a tagline. So we, a nature-centric approach, it's uncertain and it's variable and it's always changing. So that's gonna be challenging, but acknowledging that and working with the uncertainty as opposed to avoiding uncertainty. Clearly future thinking is an important part, looking at the future and what the future looks like for planning rather than planning for what's already happened. You know, understanding tipping points and transitional change. So what is the tipping point? Once that's happened, there's no going back and we're moving forward. So seeing, doing some research and finding out what they are. And then looking at the trade-offs between people, economy and nature, right? Just what are the trade-offs and which ones are we prepared to let go? Because we thought all of this was important, but what if we could say, well, for the sake of having clean water, I'm prepared to let this luxury go, for example. So one of the questions to do that would be, what would nature do? This is really interesting, right? So in disaster preparedness, response and recovery, what would nature do? How would nature manage that? How would nature build its resilience in the context of planning for a changed climate and a disaster landscape that's pretty scary? So imagine if you know we transition to a nature-centric approach in emergency management and climate action. Imagine if nature was, let me just move this. Imagine if nature was higher on the list of priorities in emergency response. Imagine if we understood what we value that informed our risk management framework. Imagine if nature was not commoditized and it wasn't seen as an asset, but actually as something that we are part of. It was nature was our family member. Imagine if we look to Indigenous wisdom and knowledge for guidance. You know, imagine if we had a nature wellbeing budget, right? So we've got something like a, a wellbeing budget in New Zealand. Imagine if there was a nature wellbeing budget and, and we had to put a nature lens across all of the legislation and policy that we passed. And imagine if people were more connected to nature, a lot of this would come if people started feeling nature and seeing the influence on their lives, perhaps they would start prioritising it more. So, you know, I want to know what's already happening that's the good stuff and, and sell it and answer these questions. What if, how to imagine and I wonder. So it's that very hopeful lens that I want to have the conversation. So, you know, we need nature to be happy and we need nature to be happy. So it's that infinity loop between the feedback between nature and humans, drawing on ancient wisdom, you know, using citizen science and drawing on the resources of people that are living around us and not just see this as the expert's job to do. Developing communities of nature, which are like communities of practice. Um, having citizen sentinels, you know, community groups say not on our watch, we're not gonna lose that species or ecosystem or habitat. So delegate responsibility to people that are on the ground. Having nature champions, like on our watch, we are gonna achieve these changes. Um, and then really having our climate change and disaster resilience conversation grounded in nature and not so human centric 